that one happen there? Thanks. Well, I do think it's time to start. And since we do have exactly 45 minutes, no more, and I'm supposed to police myself and stop, I want to allow some time for questions. And I have eight topics that I'm going to try to rush through very quickly and give you an overview of things that I think you need to know from you know across the spectrum. But I want to allow time to ask some questions. So I'm Cherie Martin. I am a faculty member at Sanford University. I used to practice law here in Tuscaloosa with Rose and Harwood. Did that for a long time and decided I wanted to make a full-time career as a writer. And I thought I should get a PhD or something as a fallback just in case because I didn't want to starve. And I know it's hard. And so throughout my um, doctoral studies, I did a lot of freelance writing primarily um, for advertising agencies, doing copywriting and corporate booklets and brochures, things like that, and also um, trade publications, industrial manufacturing trade publications. So the nice thing about that is I'm kind of a techie, geeky kind of person who likes learning about weird things. And so I got into the research of manufacturing technology and, and um, but those pay really well. So if you want to make a living as a writer, try to find some trade publications to write for as well as the creative or you know, whatever it is that you're interested in. At that time, you couldn't make a lot of money doing writing online. It was harder to monetize it, but there are some ways to do that now. And so in recent years, I ended up um, with the 2000 recession, got to be a little more challenging about 2001 and 2002, so I decided to... Um, focus on my PhD in teaching and then just do some writing on the side. And so that's what I've done ever since. But there are still really good opportunities in corporate blogging and things like that. So there are a lot of interesting niches that you can go make a living as a writer if you're really willing to do things that are maybe not exactly what you're interested in. The subject matter is broad your writing. So I've had a lot of experience doing things from both from a lawyer's side as well as first-hand experience um, as a writer. And so we, um, I'll just lay some over here. Anybody come to the end? Okay, thank you so much. So, so the, um, the topics we're going to try to cover briefly, an overview of copyright. It's not that difficult. We're going to talk about something called scraping. So if you're publishing online, you want to be aware of this and know how to work around it or deal with it. Um, we're going to talk about assigning your rights, licensing. Um, this is when you sign contracts, so we'll look at some of the contractual issues. Works for hire, which I've done. Um, derivative works and the importance of protecting your rights to derivative works if you sign contracts and sell your stuff. Um, but at least make sure you're compensated for that. We're going to talk about the Creative Commons, which is a way to help you publicize, publicize your work, spread the word, let people use some of your work with permission and attribution, or um, in some cases, give it away for free if you choose. But it's also a source for illustrations, for photography, for art to go with stories. If people have given Creative Commons licenses, then you may be able to use the pictures. We'll talk about that. And the idea of the right of publicity, and related to that, a right of privacy, and when you have real life people that you are writing about, uh, what are the constraints that you might need to deal with, and what can you do in terms of using their name or likeness. So those are the topics. Um, just want to start off by saying plagiarism and copyright are two different things, and people often conflate those two. They confuse them and think that it's plagiarism, you know, it's going to be copyright infringement, which it always will be, but if it's copyright infringement, they'll use the term plagiarism, and they're not interchangeable. Um, plagiarism is when you pretend that your work is it's actually somebody else's work and you're claiming it as your own. So you're passing yourself off as the author. None of us are going to do that. What you want to make sure is nobody is passing off your work as their own. So you don't want to have somebody plagiarize you. And as a teacher, you know, we have to be cognizant of that most students are not going to plagiarize. But occasionally somebody will get in a crunch, they got a deadline, and they go buy a paper from a paper mill. Or they will just find a paper online or a blog post today that somebody else has written, copy and paste out of the document and put it into their own essay as their story or as a, into a new story even. It's pretty easy to catch people today doing that, but you have to, to 
do the work. So plagiarism is when you pass off another person's work as your own. That will always be copyright infringement as well. Yes. Is there a software that you can search the internet for phrases or words? Or Google works perfect. I mean, there are commercial yeah. services. There are some paying services. But I had a, a student, not at Sanford, at another university, that I thought, well, this doesn't seem like their work. I copied two sentences out, copied it into the Google search, and it turned me to the paper that they used. So um, it took me like 15 seconds. So. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so it's very easy to find using Google. Um, the, um, so copyright infringement, on the other hand, this is when you give credit for the person, but you don't have permission to use their work. And that can happen to us as writers. Somebody can take our work, perhaps we've put a story, we don't have it published yet, maybe so we are published in a commercial publication, so we put it on our blog. And somebody else comes along and says, oh, I like this. Take it. And I'm going to put it over here on my blog because I want to get some traffic. It's really interesting. But I'm going to give you credit. I'm going to say, this story was written by Cherie. She did a great job. And here's where I got it from. I'm going to link back to her website. And I've been given full credit for that. But it was placed there without my permission. And that's copyright infringement. So using somebody else's work in whole or in part, even, is copyright infringement. There's uh, an exception called fair use, which we'll talk about in just a moment. But I just want to make sure that we kind of have that big picture difference. So I want to talk about copyright basics and what you, as a writer, do to make sure that you are protected. So the work that you create is protected by copyright. And it's so simple. That's why I don't want to spend a lot of time on this one topic, because all you have to do is write it down on a piece of paper, or type it into a Word document, or Google Docs, or text file, software program, and hit save. When you have saved that work in what's called a tangible medium and software counts, then it is at that moment protected by copyright. So when I created my PowerPoints, it is my, I am protected by copyright. Nobody else could legally take this and give it out as a handout or a conference presentation without my permission. They could do it, you know, it's very easy. Any of you could take it, and if I put the PowerPoints on my website, you could download them and say, this is my presentation. That would be copyright infringement unless you had my permission. And honestly, if you ask my permission, I would give it for that, so. Um, but some things you don't want to share that readily. So the key for copyright, is that you are the author, and it's an original creative work, and you save it in a tangible medium. That's all it takes. Once the writing is fixed in a tangible medium, copyright protection exists at that moment. You don't have to register it for copyright protection to exist. You don't have to write copyright notice on there. You don't have to put a little C and a date. All those things help, and we're going to talk about why you should do those things. And, um, but all it takes is to save your work in some medium. Yes? Is that true for the illustrations that go along with yes. the publication as well? Yes, and one of the things um, with copyright, it protects any original creative work um, from words on paper or words in software programs to um, photography visual images of any type, whether you take a still photo, a video that you have shot in sequence like this, or you've edited together, both of those are protected. Um, pen and ink illustrations are protected. Paintings, whether it's oil or water, any of those. You can also get copyright protection for choreographed dance routines. If you have written out or in some way using the notations that choreographers use, or musical compositions, the notations that are used for music, once you have written out the musical notations for that, the melody is protected by copyright. The song lyrics, protected by copyright because those are words that you have written somewhere. If you sing those <coughs> words into a tape recorder or an MP3 recorder and preserve that sound recording, 
that audio recording is also protected by copyright at that moment. So all of those different ways, um, sculpture as well is protected. And uh, yes? What if you learn a dance technique and then you take it in court, you know, mm -hmm. uh, maybe you have some dancers, you could choreo you know, you're the choreo mm -hmm. choreographer. Yes. For that, for you take the techniques, but you create your own kind of uh, work. If the dance moves by themselves, would not be protected. An individual, you know, if you slide across the floor. That move anybody can do. But if you slide across the floor and then wiggle your hips and shake your hand in a certain way and do something, and you've created a routine that you have written down in a sequence and said, this is my routine for this particular sequence, then that can be protected. The video recording of people performing that dance could be protected. That would be something separate from the actual routine. So people who do cheerleader camps or uh, aerobic exercise, those kinds of things, they can, um, if they choose to, protect their routines. But you, do have, you can't just, you know, I couldn't come right here and do a dance routine, it would be a really sad thing to see. <laughs> but if I did, and somebody wanted to replicate it, I haven't fixed it in any tangible medium, so it wouldn't be protected at that point. But if I took the trouble, as you know, serious choreographers do, to write out the moves in the sequence, then that can be protected. Would that also apply to the, for example, the name of a, a book? Names cannot be copyrighted. So that's, that's a good segue into what is an original creative work, because that's the key. Ideas are not something that can be copyrighted. So I have this great idea, I want to make a film or a TV show about a college and the challenges of being a student athlete at the college. It's going to be a major Southeastern University, and I'm going to pick five different athletes, and we're going to follow them around and talk to their families and their girlfriends or boyfriends or whatever, sport it may be, the opposite sex, and then do all those things. That's an idea. That is not protected. But if I create a one-page synopsis of that, then that one-page synopsis is something that's fixed. The idea underlying it is not. So somebody else could come up with, well, I'm going to make, you know, a television show about college athletics and the life of these athletes. That idea is not protected, but the characters I create and the situations I create in my story, once they're written down in a script form, can be protected. The title, let's say I'm going to call it Friday Night Lights. That was one. That was a real TV show, right? So that name is not protected by copyright. Friday Night Lights. Anybody could call their book Friday Night Lights. There is some little catches that sort of go beyond our topic, and that is trademark law. So the slogan Friday Night Lights is probably trademarked by the network producers that created that show to license merchandise. So Friday Night Lights logo on a t-shirt is going to be something they've probably protected, but it would not prevent you at all from naming your book Friday Night Lights if you're going to write an expose on high school football. You can do that and you can use that name. You know, there are sometimes there are business reasons for not doing that because it would be confusing. Um, I grew up a little bitty child in the late 60s. I loved this TV show called The Avengers. It had nothing to do with comic strips. <coughs> and I still love that show. And I bought them on DVDs when they came out. It's very confusing to everybody else because I'll talk about the Avengers. They're English people, you know, spies in the late 60s and doing really funny things have nothing to do with superheroes. And so I get hits on my blog a lot. People are looking for the Avengers, but they get the wrong ones. So, you know, for business purposes, that's confusing. So Friday Night Lights might not be the best topic or title for a new book, but on the other hand, you know, it could be a, a, there could be a great reason to use that same name. But it would limit you in some ways with the derivative materials for t-shirts and merchandising. So um, you've got to have an original creative work, which means it's more than an idea, and it's something that is original and creative. 
I cannot take a list of names, like in a telephone directory, organize those in alphabetical order, and claim a copyright in that. There was a case that went to the Supreme Court, and the court said, this is not original creative work. They've also determined, under the copyright law specifically, that recipes are not sufficiently created. They're basically just lists of ingredients and the ways you combine those. But if you take a collection of recipes that you've compiled from friends, family, celebrities, politicians, whomever, you compile those into a book that you place them in a certain order, you add some illustrations, you add some color, maybe write a little paragraph you know, about what that recipe means, then that becomes an original creative work that can be protected by copyright. So, um, the King James Version of the Bible is not protected by copyright if it, <coughs> it's too old. But a new translation, New King James, the New Revised Standard, Revised Standard, English Version, whatever translation is, those are within the period of copyright. And so those particular um, Bibles you can't use without permission. You know, if you're going to quote extensively, one verse is probably okay. So you'd do better to use the King James Version. If you're going to do a complete, comprehensive devotional of something, you don't have to get permission, that's for sure. So original creative works is a not a complex area, but it needs to be something that you've added creativity to. Taking a high school or college um, schedule of events for, the, say, the football season. Nobody can copyright the list of the games and the dates and the sounds they're going to play at. But when you take that and then you add graphics, photos, art, put it into a poster, then that poster becomes an original creative work that can be protected and you can sell it. You know, if it's university, then you're going to have to get trademark, uh, you're going to have to get permission to use the trademarks for the university to sell that poster. So that can be, those things can be complicated, but the basic copyright issues are not that complicated. So, fix in a tangible medium is creative. Once you have fixed it, it's protected. Um, the term of protection, we're going to save that just for a moment. So the question is, do you need to register it? It doesn't hurt. It can be a little bit um, expensive to... You wanna, I'm sorry, I've got a video camera going, right? Oh, oh. You. <laughs> Sorry. I don't make uh, a good screen. <laughs> the... Um, The, um, I've got one here. the um, registration is expensive for a single work, a couple hundred dollars, not terribly expensive, but you know, you don't want to go pay for a registration for an unpublished short story that you're trying to market. Or if you've written a freelance story that you're trying to sell that's nonfiction, there is no reason for you to go pay for copyright registration on that work. Um, there's just not any reason to do so. And if you're a songwriter, you're probably not going to go record uh, or seek copyright registration every time you write a song. Once you get ready to start releasing those songs, then you can um, seek registration at that time. If you have a book manuscript, the publisher is most likely going to take care of the copyright registration for you. So it's not something that you need to worry about rushing off every time you finish a work and then filing a copyright registration because you're just going to waste your money. But it is a thing to do, you know, if you're writing seriously and commercially, the publisher that you work with will take care of any necessary copyright registrations. Yes? Does that also include self-publishing or, or like you're going to a, a subsidy publisher? Yeah, it depends on the terms. I mean, they will usually as part of the contract, I mean, they'll charge you for the you know, sure. reimbursement for the fee, and it may be an add-on cost if it's uh, self-publishing or subsidized publishing, but they will take care of the process for you. It's all, it's a two-page application, but you know, it's not too com confusing, but sometimes, you know, unless you know what the terms mean, you might not know what to fill in a blank, but it's, you know, you don't need a lawyer to do it if you choose to. Um, it will take about a year to 18 months to get the actual copyright 
registration notice back in your hands. Um, there's just a backlog and they don't have enough workers to process everything. So don't feel bad if it takes forever. I think the last time I looked at the site, it said it would take eight to 10 months and it took 18. And uh, it was for a church cookbook that I did for um, a client when I was still practicing law. Um, go ahead and include a copyright notice on any work that you put out on the web in particular, not because it's required, but because it's helpful. So many people don't know what the rules are, and they will say, well, there's no copyright notice, so that means I can just use it. And so a lot of times you have plagiarism or copyright infringement, either one, just because they don't know that the copyright notice isn't required. If you are using WordPress or Blogger or um, certain sites like that to host your blog, it's probably got a built-in copyright notice for you, mine does, so you don't have to worry about adding it. Um, I, I don't personally worry very much about it. You know, sometimes I'll add it, sometimes I don't, but rarely do I ever add it to something unless, I don't know, if I'm going to distribute it widely, I'll probably put it on there. But if I forget to, it's no big deal. But it certainly doesn't hurt because it does put the world on notice that this is your work and you're claiming copyright and they then have no excuse to say, well, I didn't know. So that's the reason it's a safeguard. Could this relate to the domain name of the blog? Uh, the domain all? name is a different um, animal. So once you've registered the domain name, nobody else can get it. If you want to trademark that domain name, you could file a trademark application for those that combination of words, but it would not be something you could protect by copyright. So domain names, my blog is the Ben Franklin Follies. The domain name is benfranklinfollies.com. I'm protected in terms of a domain. Somebody else could go, you know, do a benfranklinfollies.info or whatever. I don't have that because I just didn't pay for it. I keep thinking I will and I never get around to it. They could do it and there's nothing I could do about it, except that I have been using it long enough that I would have trademark, co common law trademark protections in that phrase, and so I think I could make them stop, you know. I, I don't think anybody's going to probably do it. That's So the trademark is where those would come up. Yes? If a person does claim that they didn't know something, mm -hmm. this, is the law any less lenient on them? There can be, um, there are statutory damages. Once you, if somebody ever does infringe your work and you're going to sue, go ahead and file a copyright registration immediately. If you go to a lawyer, they're going to tell you to do that because you want to sue in federal court. And if you, um, if you have it registered at the time they infringe, you can get more damages. And there can be punitive damages as well if it was an egregious um, copyright violation. If it's just an innocent infringement, there are still statutory damages that you can get if you've registered it at that point. So it's um, it could go to whether they um, <coughs> willfully violated copyright, but it's not going to prevent you from getting damages. And then the last point on copyright, I want to talk before, um, well actually let me give you the term. So uh, the copyright term currently is 70 years plus the life of the author for works that are created by individuals like all of us. If you are a television production company, corporation, then those are corporate works or film production company. Those corporate works have a protection of um, 95 years from publication or 125 years from creation, whichever is the longest. So it's forever. I included a picture of Steamboat Willie because it's Disney who lobbied for all these copyright extensions, um, and at least the most recent one. And you'll see from the outset under the Constitution, provides for Congress to enact copyright protection. Originally in the United States, and 1780s, the copyright protection was 14 years, and then it could be renewed for 14 years. Then it was 28 years plus, and then 50 years in some life. And then Disney, when Steamboat Willie, Mickey Mouse character, was about to lose copyright protection, they begged and begged and begged and said, you know, we'll go out of business basically if we don't get copyright protection. So Mickey, for longer, 
And um, so Congress extended it to 70 years plus the life of the author for the corporate, 95 years for publication. So we've got a few more years left in Mickey Mouse's copyright protection. Um, probably in the late part of this decade, we will see more efforts to extend that again. So just be watching around 2017 or something like that. Uh, so fair use. Fair use is the um, provisions of the copyright law that allow others to use portions of copyrighted works without infringing copyright. So essentially a copyright infringement is any unauthorized use. So if I take a picture of Steamboat Willie and put it in this slide presentation, that is technically a copyright infringement. The question is, is that a fair use? And my argument is yes, because this is for criticism and comment on the Disney's role in the um, copyright legislation. It's also related to education because we're using it in a workshop setting for educational purposes. So I don't think there's any problem with using it for this purpose. If I were to put this on a t-shirt, start selling it, it is no longer fair use. That's a big difference. So using it in an educational setting, limited distribution, or for criticism and commentary, it's fair use. Um, using it for commercial purposes, it's not. So fair use gets pretty complicated, but I've given you um, four factors that the Supreme Court has said will be considered when trying to decide is this use a copyright infringement or was it in fact permissible and there's an exception for it. So if somebody takes your whole story that you've written and, or your blog post, gives you credit but they put it on their website, there's no way that's going to be fair use. If they take the whole thing, it will never be fair use. If you write a sweet 